So I uh, came from Brodsworth, an impact study. This is a case study, and it's a case study of retrofitting impact evaluation onto a conservation in action project. So um, conservation in action is increasingly part of the way that heritage sites are managing their building repair and conservation schemes. I'm sure you'll have noticed that recently if you've visited the National Trust properties. Um, and on archaeological projects, obviously, we're for very familiar, uh, we've been doing it for years, with, with opening up sites for visit days and make, inviting the public to see what's being revealed and discovered. But conservation practice at Heritage Properties has only recently really begun to in, engage with this kind of public interaction. Uh, up until fairly recently, conservation work, as you be well aware, has generally been hidden behind scaffolding or hoardings, it's been conducted during the closed season or, or by shutting down the property completely uh, for the duration. Uh, the National Trust has been at the forefront of this new public engagement practice at places like um, Clandon Park here after the fire in 2016-17, um, also at, at sites like Croom Park and at Knoll and English Heritage and other heritage uh, property owners are gradually sort of taking this idea up. So conservation in action is about bringing conservation into the public domain as part of the visitor experience. Uh, but very little consideration has been given yet to thinking about how we look at the impact of that. Um, what impact uh, opening up <coughs> conservation to the public gaze actually brings in terms of changes in attitude, how, it, how, it need, how we need to change our attitudes to what we do to include public participation. And indeed, um, what the impact is on opening up our practice to new audiences and in changing public attitudes. We're only just beginning to think now in the, in the, in the bigger picture about how do ways in which we make conservation accessible uh, enable us to sh uh, create much more meaningful understanding of material culture. Um, for example, that it changes, that it's mutable, that it's constantly changing, it's not a fixed thing, which often is a preconception people come with. Uh, that it's vulnerable to climate change impacts and to environmental uh, fluctuation, that there are difficult debates in conservation about intervention, about how far you go, how much you put back that whole conservation versus restoration debate. So in conservation, we face exactly the same issues as in archaeology about how we evaluate the effectiveness of public engagement and those meaningful measures that we can use for the social value that we aim to create in what we do. So I hope some of what I'm going to talk about, although it's about building conservation and interiors conservation primarily, Will, will resonate with some of the things you just heard and um, with, with what happens in practice in archaeology. Now, when you have visitors on an archaeological site, they're generally there or they're taking part in an archaeological project as a, a member of a community. They're generally there because they want to be involved, they want to find out what's going on, and they want to, to understand what new discoveries are being made or can be made. At a heritage attraction like a country house or a ruined ancient monument, People are generally there because they're interested in the place and they've chosen to visit it for a day out. And often they'll have paid for that visit. So when they find that a large part of the site is scaffolded under hoardings, under dust wraps, they can be very negatively impacted by that experience. Uh, so what I want to talk about is how we're becoming a bit more agile now, working with to turn what's an apparently a bad news story, you can't really see what you've come to see because we're in the middle of fixing it, um, to a much a more positive story, um, as has been seen at, at Clandon, where that disaster, that uh, catastrophic fire has been turned into the opportunity to show people exactly how complex and challenging recovery after that kind of disaster can be. And to sites like Croom here, another National Trust property, uh, where a tea room was opened on top of the scaffolds with a publicly accessible staircase up to the top uh, where children and adults could go up to see the work going on and talk to some of the uh, stonemasons who were working on the repairs. So, uh, opening up conservation to visitor scrutiny 
has been assumed as good practice by curators and by collection managers. We think about it positively as a way to explain the challenges and the complexities of what we do, um, the, the, the care with which decisions are made. We spend a lot of time agonising about those decisions ourselves and we want to share that. But is that interesting to the public and how do we know? And we try to explain that. At an institutional level, it's a way for charitable bodies like the National Trust and English Heritage to show how their, their donations and subscriptions are being used, uh, often in very unseen but very important ways to conserve a property. But is this a, a double-edged uh, weapon? If people see the way their money is being used, will they agree that it's well spent uh, and worthwhile? And how do we know? So there are challenges in, in opening up what we do in conservation. And from a business perspective, for a property manager, this can be an opportuni opportuni opportunistic way of diversifying a visiting experience to open it up to the public while conservation is going on. It certainly encourages repeat visits, but importantly, it is a way of keeping buildings open. There's a real revenue driver behind this so that the income continues to come in while the work's underway. But that's fraught with all sorts of unintended consequences. It can be a nightmare of logistical challenges and potentially it brings rather negative visitor experience with it. So how much do we actually know about the impact of conservation in action projects from a participant perspective? Uh, the Brodsworth Hall project was an opportunity for us to, respect, to explore this and it was retrospectively um, uh, done. In other words, there was no evaluation of impact built into the project. Uh, we, we got involved as, to do this as a piece of research after the project was effectively completed. Um, but it was a way of doing a, a, an end of project review to see how better impact might be achieved in the future. So firstly, a little bit about Brodsworth Hall. Uh, Brodsworth is in South Yorkshire near, Lancaster, uh, near Doncaster. Sorry. Uh, it's one of uh, English Heritage's uh, furnished historic houses. It's a remarkable survival of an 1860s country house as an ensemble, complete with mo most of its original furniture and furnishings uh, and, and fittings. Uh, English Heritage took the house on in 1995 after a very long period of decline and neglect. Uh, while it continued to be lived in by the widow of the last member of the family for decades, with the house gradually fading um, and getting more and more worn out um, and uh, deteriorating around her. So when English Heritage took it on, the building and its interiors were in a very fragile but remarkably complete state. It was a kind of palimpsest, really, of the family's life there over a hundred years. And so rather than restore the building, um, they took the decision to gently conserve and clean and stabilise those interiors just as they were found. Um, some of it in some disarray in, the, in a state of already in a state of abandonment where the family had retreated from the upper floors. 20 years on after that initial conservation programme the cycle of repair and conservation came round again. The roof was leaking, the, the remarkable mechanical shutters, uh, window shutters were broken and jammed, carpets were dirty, the environmental controls were not working well, there was a lot of work to do. And rather boldly English Heritage took the decision that while this major programme of conservation work was going on they would keep the house fully open and they would make presentation of the conservation part of the visiting experience. So caring for Brodsworth, as the project was known, um, was the first uh, major project of this kind that English Heritage had done. Um, and it, the idea was to give people a better understanding, um, so this is the thing we're trying to test in our evaluation, a better understanding of what goes on behind the scenes and what is involved in maintaining and conserving historic house interiors and the decisions that you have to make as you do that. Every room had a themed presentation of conservation uh, issues and challenges, uh, friend or foe, uh, victim uh, or um, survivor. Um, the building conservation contractor had some blocks of days set aside to allow the masons and joiners working on the project to spend time talking to the public. And the specialist conservators working on things like the shutter conservation also had time 
to do uh, public <coughs> Q&A sessions. Uh, and there were listening posts around the house where you could listen to recordings of people, even if there weren't people around to talk to. So that much was planned and installed, uh, and then the unforeseen happened. And with the building scaffolded and the interiors completely hoarded out and protected for uh, the conservation work, the contractor went bankrupt and everything had to stop. So that carefully planned 10-month programme uh, most of which was meant to have been done while the building was closed uh, and during the, the slow season had to be rescheduled and unexpectedly they ended up starting the programme in the middle or just at the start of the very busy spring and summer uh, season when the house was fully open to thousands of visitors. So the project team um, responded by embracing this opportunity um, in a very fleet of foot way um, to be not only inter an interpretation scheme about conservation, but to be a conservation in action project. And central to the success of that, I think it's true to say, is that the, the conservation project manager, who was the person who coordinated every single opportunity, and this really was conservation in action, to work with um, the, the people cleaning the carpets, the people taking down the chandeliers, the picture conservators, uh, demounting pictures, the conservation shutter conservators, the repairs to the roof lanterns, to the masonry, and indeed the whole process of documenting the contents of the rooms before they were moved, and then the process of reassembling them after the work was finished. So during all of this, the staff and the contractors were all encouraged to talk to people about what they were doing, to answer questions, and the room stewards were briefed as well on what was happening every week. So. Uh, that was one key um, success, I think, in the impact assessment, this sort of project coordinator who ensures that all of that interactive work is, is planned and, and meshes together well. Another key success factor in the impact was the building contractor who was completely on board with working with the public and working around them with all the health and safety issues that that brings with it. Uh, and who communicated the same messages about their part of the project. So this was an amazing opportunity to evaluate impact, but as I say, it wasn't built into the programme, so that, that's the first take-home message, really, that evaluation of impact, as we've already heard, needs to be planned and embedded in the project from the outset. However, there was uh, some... Uh, intention to get visitor feedback as part of the project, clearly, um, and that had been planned. Uh, and at the end of the guided tour of the house, there was a small table with visitor comment cards on it, uh, and people completed those as they entered their visit. Uh, when we came on board in 2017, to, at the end of the project, and suggested um, that we do this, ca this case study, there had been about 1,600 written feedback response cards. Now, that sounds quite a lot. Quite a lot, doesn't it? It's quite a sizable sample for qualitative uh, analysis. But in fact, it was less than 1% of their visitor numbers over this period. So that's the first thing that you have to think about in, in, in the feedback process is how representative is it going to be? And in fact, they were of very limited value to us in the uh, impact evaluation because, as you can see, people didn't really write very much. It was a small postcard. They tended to write very generalised comments and the children love filling them in far more than the adults. So we actually got a completely <coughs> skewed representation of views from children, which was great for once to have that. But again, it, it, in terms of evaluation, it was a little bit skewed. So to gather more data about the reception of the project and, and how it had worked, we interviewed 20 staff, which included quite a number of uh, the room stewards uh, and the people who'd worked on the project to get their experience of how it had gone and their account of how visitors had reacted. But most revealingly of all, we mined uh, the, and this comes back to what was said in the previous presentation about doing this retrospectively, we mined the online data and that was the most useful material. Uh, all that stuff from social media and uh, user-generated content, particularly from TripAdvisor, um, to gather comments and observations from visitors uh, over the period that the project had been underway. And as the project developed, the team itself got much more 
adept at making the opportunities of social media work for them to get people engaged with the messages that they wanted to be the take-home messages. Uh, and the social media also helped us to, and the user-generated content also helped us to get a much better balance of views um, because people uh, will say things uh, online and at greater length um, than they will write on a card and they, they don't hold back from negative criticism online whereas on site people are generally quite polite about their comments. So you get um, from the a combination of the two kinds of feedback you're getting a much more balanced view of the experience as a whole for those who had not such a great time as well as those who really enjoyed it. And what we found was that um, visitors see conservation very differently from professionals and at the start of the project they were quite negative. They felt that their visit had been spoiled by the fact that this conservation work was going on. So critically, the means by which conservation is presented, foregrounded in the visit, management of expectations is really critical to that positive impact and communication. So for example, setting up expectations about what the visit would be like was absolutely essential when people arrived. It was the front of house staff at the ticketing point who played the key role in that, um, sending out the positive messages about you're going to be able to see this today, you can look out for this, here's who you can talk to, and not apologising that the house was in a bit of a state and some of the rooms were closed, which immediately, of course, would send the wrong message. So here the challenge really about impact was reorienting well, the imagined country house visit into what people would actually encounter uh, in a country house that was in the process of being uh, conserved and renovated. At the start, the only place that signalled that was the website. Um, there wasn't anything about it at the ticketing point. There wasn't even a notice board to explain it. So you can imagine that the journey in terms of impact from the beginning of the project to the end, after all of this experience had been embedded in changing the way that the project ran, uh, was really quite remarkable. Focusing on places where people spend their time, like the tea room and the picnic area, were really good places to make impact, getting messages across. That was where the contractor's site entrance was placed. So they were encouraged as they went on and off site through the uh, hoarding to the scaffolding to stop and talk to people about what they were doing that day. Interaction with um, the people, the house stewards, the specialist conservators, the conservation assistants, was the single single um, most influential common denominator in positive comments, positive feedback comments, um, where people had interacted with other people, they had understood much better what was going on and, and what the value of the work was. Uh, but we didn't get that out of the written feedback, really. You had to infer that. So, for example, the kitchen, which we just saw, when the kitchen was being um, stripped out and <coughs> conserved and it was full of scaffolding to repair the, the light in, in the roof it wasn't possible to see anything there so a whole um, CCTV video cam set up was created so visitors could look on camera at what was going up on the top of the scaffold but actually we never got any feedback about whether that was successful or not so a key message there is if you want to know about the impact of an expensive intervention or like a listening post or a, 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 a mini exhibition panel set up, then you do need to design some specific kind of evaluation into the experience of using that intervention um, if you really want to understand whether it made a difference. So things like this, we just had to infer that they had had an impact on what people saw in their experience. So how did the project impact more profoundly on the way that audiences thought about conservation and its value? Did it change thinking? Did it encourage support for this kind of uh, work that we do? Uh, could we do more to harness the, the impact or the effects of new knowledge and understanding? We got some very positive insights, um, glimpses of, I think, where um, the theory of change approach would be really valuable, uh, where... Um, we could use attitudinal research to our advantage to get uh, glimpses of uh, 
how people people's thinking and ideas have moved, have been moved by, have been changed by the experience. Uh, and we've got a lot to learn from our colleagues in social sciences and in market research who do a lot of this stuff already. So I would get a volunteer senior market researcher on your team and, and get them to give you good value for money. The Conservation in Active projects um, the Conservation in Action project certainly did encourage longer dwell times, that was very clear. Uh, it, there was more for people to see, there was more for them to do, there were people to talk to, and it encouraged repeat visits. And interestingly, observation of some of the repeat visits, often local people, um, revealed that they themselves then became advocates for what they'd learned. So there was a kind of a snowball effect in the impact. And so they would, the visitors, the repeat visitors, would tell their conservation stories of what they'd seen to the people that they were bringing with them. And for the volunteer room stewards, they were really impressed, uh, surprised and impressed, uh, by the way in which talking about the conservation challenges of the house kind of mirrored its history. They were a sort of conservation biography of the house. And that became a new focus for what they could talk to people about. Uh, and people were typically very fascinated and intrigued to, to share those stories. And finally, there were some, I think, very tantalising but rather few responses in trying to see whether the distinction between restoration and conservation, which the curators for this project were really keen, was a message we should try and get over, whether that really did have impact, whether it was meaningful to visitors. There were, there were a few responses that seemed to um, indicate that, but equally a lot of the um, comments on TripAdvisor were very disappointed that the house wasn't being restored to its former Victorian glory and, and thought that it, it was rather let down by being left in this shabby state. But interestingly, there was a really good cluster of comments in the analysis of the online and the, the feedback data uh, about, about things to do with truthfulness and integrity and honesty and authenticity. Uh, and and those, those ideas came over very strongly. So those were messages that we had hoped would be reinforced. There are a lot of lessons for, that were learned from the Brodsworth uh, Evaluation Project. Um, I'll share those with you. Uh, embed it before you start. Continually review how it's going and innovate and expect to change it. <coughs> expect that it won't work as you want and expect to change it. Include those really focused mini evaluations for the things that are new or expensive interventions. Are they working? Were they worth it? Would you do it again? If you did, would you do it differently? Take social media and user-generated content very seriously. Monitor it and respond to it. And you can see here in this little progression of comments through the project, um, and we, it wasn't... Um, Consistent, there were still people at the end who were a bit disappointed, but the, the weight of the opinions being expressed in the social media through the, uh, the, the life of the project showed a clear movement, really, from uh, people being rather disappointed and not understanding through to thinking the work was really important, through to getting the point about conservation and not restoration. And finally, we could be much, we could be so much smarter, I think, in the research that we do into impact just by asking the right questions. And I'm sure that theory of change model will be very helpful for that. And, and actually building pathways to impact right the way through our projects to be really effective. Thank you.